Greetings, students. Mr. Little here. And today we're going to have a look at chapter 32, part one. That is the origins, the beginnings of the age of imperialism or the imperial age. And ask the central question, huh, was it actually all that new? Does it deserve its own title? I don't know. Let's have a look. So by the end of today's presentation, you should be able to answer the two following central questions. How did the technological and economic consequences of the Industrial Revolution set the stage for imperialism after 1800? And how did newer and older social ideas and cultural ideas provide the rationale for imperial expansion between 1750 and 1900? One of the things that you always ask, and one of the things I always ask when talking about the age of imperialism is, when did it start? And is it actually a distinct age? Because most people, when they think about an empire and they think about Europe, they might think of the Americas, right? Unit four, unit three, these big landed empires like the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, or the British, right? If the age of imperialism is traditionally defined as a time period beginning around 1760, that's how European industrializing nations engage in the process of colonizing, influencing, and annexing other parts of the world, that doesn't actually sound that new, except perhaps for the industrializing part. And so there's this question of, how different from the age of imperialism was the age of exploration, right? And there were some distinctions, right? So for example, there was more technology and there were larger populations, uh, which partially meant there was a greater control over all aspects of life. There was a higher number of migrants moving all around the world. The continued exploitation of resources and populations around the world. Um, but then there are some distinctions that maybe aren't so distinctive, right? You Previously, you had something called the missionary drive. You might remember Queen Isabella wanted to Christianize all the peoples of the world uh, versus something that's going to become prominent in the age of imperialism called the civilizing mission, the desire to bring progress and civilization. These new empires also have a certain racialized element that might have been missing or present in a different form in older societies. You might remember the racial hierarchy of, of the caste system in Latin America. It also raises the question, when does it start? Does it start in 1757 at the Battle of Plassey, where the British gained their first foothold in Bengal? Does it start with Napoleon's invasion of Egypt? Or does it start in the 1840s with the Opium War, with the British smashing open with their industrial might, uh, the world's largest empire and economy at that point? So one of the key distinctions that distinguishes the age of imperialism, perhaps from the age of colonialism, was the impact of industrial revolution. Now, some scholars have talked about capitalism being the distinctive form, but if we remember the age of colonialism had the first companies in the form of the East India companies. So I don't know if that's a clear distinction to be drawn, but the industry was definitely a big distinction. Now, you might remember during the Industrial Revolution, coal was the initial source of power. However, as the Industrial Revolution expands and becomes more complex, especially what we call the Second Industrial Revolution, new items are needed, things like tin, copper, rubber, palm oil, petroleum, for lubricating machines, for laying power lines, for creating tires for cars, bicycles and belts for machines. So all of these resources are geographically restricted to certain regions. Europe doesn't have a lot of these. And so that could be a distinction. However, it's worth remembering that part of the reason Europeans set out to get the spices from the Spice Islands was because spices are geographically limited to tropical regions. For much of their time going out and conquering other places, Britain claimed that it was doing what it was doing in the name of free trade, right? We're opening up the world to free trade. We are civilizing the Chinese by promoting free trade. However, once these empires were established, they oftentimes became closed markets. Uh, this concept of free trade as a, as a motive for building these empires and then promptly not going ahead and promoting free trade once they have these empires. Well, the Hong Kong and Shanghai banking corporations were founded in 1865 to promote the trade in goods back to Great Britain, but in particular to promote the sale of opium into China. And there were also financial shifts. So for example, with the abolition of the slave trade, which meant no more moving enslaved individuals from Africa to other parts of the world, mostly the Caribbean, this pivoted instead to financing production. So one of the things that's sometimes not understood very well is that it's true, the abolition of slave trade ended slavery in European possessions, but but then slave financiers simply shifted their money to financing the production of goods in Africa that used slaves. So for example, the cocoa bean was a huge component for chocolate and hence it was highly in demand in Europe. And so many of these companies, the same people who had purchased slaves and transported slaves simply shifted to financing the production of cacao plantations in West Africa, which utilized slaves. So it really shifted the location of slavery. With the abolition of slavery, slaves were not compensated for their work, but you know who was? The slave owners. They got the equivalent of 23 billion US dollars across the British empire for the loss of their slaves. On the cultural and social side, we have 
straight up what we might call racism as a motivation for imperialism. And the reasons for this are complicated, but I think you could probably boil it down to two major factors, one of which was there were 400 years of normalized race-based slavery. For 400 years, individuals around the world had associated the practice of slavery with dark skin. Combine this with the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment had some ideas on race. In particular, Montesquieu is known for his environmental determinism. That is his idea that the environment shaped the inherent intellectual abilities of some races of people. Specifically, he talked about people in warmer climates are less prone, less able to govern themselves. Now, initially, many of these expansionist adventures, so for example, the East India Company in South Asia, uh, they tended to go native in the worst way, as one historian has termed it. They essentially saw themselves as replacing the empires that they were administering. So early East India Company administrators learned Persian and learned about South Asian culture because they saw themselves as the successors to, for example, the Mughal Empire. Doesn't mean they did not exploit the peasants like any empire would. And then we get to the interesting part about the roots of imperialism, and that is literature and the science. Around the mid-1800s, a book is published called The Inequality of the Human Races by a guy named Francis Galton, who conceived of the idea that there were different levels of intellectual ability, and therefore there were different ranks of humans. Some humans were just better than others. He did this through something called phrenology, which is the study of skull sizes, which at the time was very popular to claim that skull size has an impact on intelligence and ability to govern. And the idea that we should have certain people governing others and others not be allowed to have a say in their future is called eugenics. It's another way of saying scientific racism, the idea that we need to control the genetics of the population through selective breeding and perhaps simply racist policy. Now, these thinkers, including Galton and others, drew heavily on the work of Charles Darwin, his origin of species, in which he talked about evolution. People took this idea of evolution, that is descent with modification, and applied it to human culture and said, some cultures are just more evolved than other cultures. In defense of Darwin here, Darwin never talked about a hierarchical classification. Darwin never said certain species are better than other species. He said species are adapted to fit their environment, not this species is better than the other species. The classification of the hierarchy is human additive onto the theory of evolution. And all of this was complemented by a poem by a guy named Rudyard Kipling, who also wrote The Jungle Book, interestingly enough, called The White Man's Burden. And he published this poem in 1899. So this is well into the age of imperialism, but essentially he argued that not only, not only were the white races better, and he, we know he meant white because he says white in the title of the work, not only are the white races better, but they have an obligation to go out and civilize and bring progress to the lower races. This became sort of a rallying cry, the idea of the duty of the white man to go out and civilize uh, the lower races. And this would be internalized by other groups. So for example, the Japanese upon their conquest of Korea and their expanding influence in China also adopted this sort of white man's burden mentality where it was the burden of the Japanese people to liberate East Asia. Tough job to bring civilization to the rest of the world, whether they want it or not, right? And Kipling was pretty clear about this in the poem. He's like, whether they want it or not, we're going to bring them civilization. And there's a great illustration you can see here. This is part of it. And anthropomorphized Great Britain carrying a basket with a number of people symbolized by their attire. So somebody from the Middle East, somebody from East Asia, somebody from South Asia, carrying them up this hill to something called civilization at the top. That ideas about race, racial superiority, and racial hierarchies uh, are both a cause and an effect. So it's a cause of imperialism in the sense that it justified future expansion, but it was also an effect of imperialism because with the expansion of imperial powers, this seemed to justify the argument that the European race was on top and every other race was on the bottom. On the political side of things, there were benefits to undertaking imperial expansion. So for example, it might increase your reach as a world power. So from 1815 to 1915, there's something called Pax Britannica. There's this idea that Britain uh, imposed a sort of universal peace through their naval power. And they had their naval power because they had expanded all over the world and they had naval bases all over the world. And the US also sought to build itself up as a naval power. And this motivated them in part to annex the island of Hawaii, where they would build a very famous naval base called Pearl Harbor. And so in addition to the potential benefits of increasing one's territorial reach and becoming a world power, within imperial societies, 
imperial expansion could diffuse political and social tensions. So in the United States, this is something called the frontier thesis, the idea that democracy only survives because it can expand outward and it can release the built up social tensions that have been created by industrialization. But the same idea was seen all over the world, all over the imperial world at this time. The second French empire, when it was coming under political pressure, sought support in foreign colonial wars. This meant attacking Mexico, this meant attacking Algeria, prop up the government by rallying everybody around a foreign war. And this was, Otto von Bismarck's idea in Germany as well. He wanted to draw attention away from socialism and unite everybody around the idea of imperial expansion. So there were political benefits to expanding territorially as an imperial power. Of course, all this imperial expansion would not have been possible were it not for the industrial revolution's creation of faster, deadlier weapons. And among these include battleships, artillery, but probably the machine gun would be one of the most devastatingly used tools uh, throughout the later half of the 19th century. And the Battle of Omdurman in 1898 against the Modists perhaps demonstrates this really well, because you have about 100,000 Modists going up against I believe 20,000 British and Egyptian soldiers. And the combination of artillery and machine guns means that the Anglo-Egyptian force is able to defeat an enemy force over five times its size. One of the reasons that Europeans have been stuck on the coast during units three and four, right? Those trading post empires was because they didn't have the number superiority to go in and attempt to conquer the interior of Africa. But with the development of machine guns, uh, this made it possible. Suddenly it didn't matter if there were only a hundred Europeans against 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 enemies, if you had a machine gun and some artillery, you could potentially level the playing field. However, it's also worth noting that this really was just the technology to an extent. When technologically on equal footing, Europeans could totally be defeated, like they were at the Battle of Adwa, where the Italians, who were defeated by a technologically equivalent military from Ethiopia. Advances in medicine and sanitation, such as quinine being the most notable, uh, quinine being an anti-malaria drug based on a tree that grows in South America, made it possible for Europeans to travel into the jungles of Africa and not die of malaria, as had happened so many times previously. This combined with other developments like refrigeration, which made life much more comfortable in the colonies. It wasn't necessarily a death sentence. This was a very comfortable life you could potentially be living. Combine that with soap. Soap is really interesting here because not only did soap help imperial expansion by increasing the hygiene of imperial administrators and imperial soldiers, but soap also became a symbol of European superiority. Your teachers might have shown you this. Uh, if they haven't, uh, you should definitely look it up, is that pear soap, which I think you can actually still buy in Singapore today, I could be mistaken about that, uh, becomes a, a symbol of European or, or Western superiority. There's even a pear soap ad in which a man is washing his hands with pear soap, and it's literally called washing the white man's burden or something along those lines. And so the idea of soap and cleanliness becoming a symbol of Western superiority uh, became really prominent across advertising at this time. In 2016, there was a Chinese laundry detergent called Xiaobi, and they released an ad which witnessed a uh, African man uh, or someone of African descent being put into a washing machine uh, with this detergent and coming out clean and and Asian looking. We've seen that before and the idea of soap being associated with moral, cultural, economic or political superiority is not anything new. One additional technological innovation was the rapid communication that was made possible by things like telegraph lines, large canals that connected large oceans, as well as railroads and steamships. Steamships in particular made it possible for Europeans to travel into the interior of Africa, something that had not been possible before, increased the speed of soldiers and resources being moved around. The Suez and the Panama canals are two very interesting instances of canals cutting down on the travel time. Um, so for example, it cut down, not needing to sail all the way around Africa as Vasco da Gama did, cut down on the time needed to get from Britain or Europe to India. Uh, same thing with the Panama Canal, it made it much easier to get from the eastern coast of the United States to the western coast of the United States. And so reducing travel time, again, helped reassert imperial authority. The telegraph line is also really important. In addition to the fact that you can just send telegraphs and let someone know on the other side of the world what's happening, this can prevent rebellions from getting out of hand. This can prevent small disagreements from being adjudicated by a local administrator and said they could wire home for information 
from their colonial capital. And what's really interesting is that this spread not only over land, but also over sea. You have a bunch of undersea cables, as can be seen from this map up here. And so the tools of communication really allowed for imperial expansion on a scale that previously had either been very difficult or just straight up not possible. So when examining the origins of imperialism, there's a couple of really big themes that come up. And you probably noticed them in this presentation, but let's just review them really quickly. One is that there is the economic motivation, the demand for new resources, new markets, and the motives of new financial institutions. There's the ideological, that is the social cultural component, that is the combination of eugenics, uh, the belief in the science of races and certain races being superior to others, combine this with social Darwinism, inspired by pseudosciences that drove imperial powers and then justified further imperial expansion. There's also the political element that is gaining territory over a rival or by distracting dissent in your own home country by expanding outward. And then there was, of course, the technological component, new weapons like machine guns, medicine like quinine, and communication technologies like telegraph lines, the Suez Canal, steamships, railroads, you name it, makes it possible to have tighter control over your empire. So when talking about the origins of imperialism, keep these four themes in mind. And so by 1900, this is what the map of the world looked like, with the exception of most of South America and parts of Mexico and a few parts of Central Asia and a few countries in Africa, pretty much everywhere in the globe was under the domination of an imperial power. The two largest ones, of course, being Britain and France by just sheer size and territory, followed up by a number of secondary powers, such as Germany, Russia, Belgium, the Netherlands, Japan, and the United States, followed by some minor powers, who had some territorial holdings but didn't make any claim to greatness, such as Argentina, Chile, both of whom argued over the Antarctic and the Pampas, uh, Egypt, which for a time had colonies in Sudan, uh, Italy, which had some colonies in Africa, Norway, which claimed territory in Antarctica. That was its imperial claim after 1912. I should say in 1900, Norway was under the control of Sweden. And then you had a number of declining imperial powers who were losing influence or authority on a global scale, even if they still held on to their imperial territories, such as Portugal, Spain, Denmark, who had some Caribbean islands, the Habsburgs in Europe, the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, and the Qing dynasty uh, in Asia in general. So, Thank you so much for joining me. You should be able to answer those first two questions from the beginning of the presentation. My name is Mr. Little, and I will see you next time. Hey there, thanks so much for watching. I hope this video was able to help you. If you appreciate this kind of work, please like and subscribe. And of course, I welcome any kind of feedback or suggestions, so feel free to leave a comment down below. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Mr. Little, and I'll see you next time.